I bought a few 46 CPUs on eBay months back, but only now got around to testing them. In the course of benchmarking, I came across some very unexpected results from two of them. These CPUs have some secrets, and they aren't quite what they appear to be. This first one here is an AMD DX4100 with model number 100SV8B. This is a 100 megahertz chip with eight kilobytes of L1 cache. It's the newer enhanced AM486, so that means it has right back L1 cache support for systems that can take advantage of it. The last two characters in the model number denote the cache amount and whether it's right back or right through cache. So eight for eight kilobytes and B for right back. Intel's popular DX4100 actually had twice the L1 cache at 16 kilobytes, but it cost quite a bit more. Having an 8 kilobyte DX4 was an easy way for AMD to undercut Intel without having to sacrifice too much in the way of performance. AMD did have 16 kilobyte DX4s available as well, but they were less common and came out a bit later. The next chip I have here is a late model AMD DX266 with model number 66V16BGC. Bit of a mouthful. This one is also the enhanced variety with a full 16 kilobytes of right back L1 cache, which makes it a more potent performer than the original DX266 is from Intel and AMD. Like all DX2s, it makes use of a two times multiplier, but being a newer model, it does require a 3.3 volt capable motherboard. So what secrets could these relatively value oriented 46s hold? Let's get them into the test bench and take a look. I'm gonna be using one of my favorite PCI based 46 boards here the Shuttle Hot 433 Revision 4.0. And this is pretty much what you could expect to see in the era of three volt 486s and especially DX4s in the mid nineties. I'm gonna start with the AMD DX4 here. So the board does officially support the chip and I'm just gonna set the jumpers based on the manual's recommendations. This one's technically a 3.3 volt part if I'm not mistaken, but it can run at 3.45 volts safely if that's what your board provides. Okay, so the system started up just fine. Let's launch check CPU from Phil's DOS benchmark pack. And yeah, well, everything looks pretty standard and as expected here, we've got a DX4 running at three times 33 megahertz and the L1 cache is in right back mode. Not seeing any secrets or oddities here so far. Looking at SpeedSys, we can see that the CPU performance benchmark is about where we'd expect, but the memory performance test shows a very curious result. On a CPU like this, we'd expect to see memory bandwidth drop off very steeply at eight kilobytes as we move from L1 to L2 cache, but that didn't happen. L1 cache performance was consistent all the way up until 16 kilobytes. Looking at the cache check tool tells us the same, and the summary pretty clearly tells us that we have 16 kilobytes of L1 cache on this CPU. But why on earth would AMD do this? I mean, they have a 16 kilobyte version of the DX4. Why not just label it correctly? I can't say with 100% certainty, but I suspect that they had some orders to fill for very specific part numbers and probably a lot more 16 kilobyte cores than eight kilobyte ones. And if I had to guess again, I would say it's probably all coming down to one of AMD's most famous 486 CPUs, the AM5X86. They made tons of these and they sold them at very reasonable prices to provide buyers with alternatives to the very expensive Pentium CPUs hitting the markets at the time. If we look at the date code on the DX4 that I have here, it's the 42nd week of 1996, quite late for a 486. AMD had already been making AM5x86s for about a year by this point. Probably just didn't make sense to produce both 8 kilobyte and 16 kilobyte cores by late 1996. The big question is whether this chip is actually an enhanced 486 or literally a relabeled AM5x86 with a secret four times multiplier, which would be really cool. Motherboards that officially support DX4 processors will have a jumper to switch between the two available multipliers. To get the 4x multiplier activated on an AM5x86, you actually have to set the jumper that would normally be used to force a DX4 to use the lower two times multiplier. Sounds a little bit backwards, but it was an easy way for them to ensure compatibility in boards that didn't officially support the AM5x86. If I set the jumper in question, I should know right away. If it's a DX4, it'll drop down to 2x. If it's actually an AM5x86, it'll give me 4x and a very spicy 133 megahertz clock. So let's see what happens. And <laughs> look at that, the BIOS is already reporting that it's an AM5x86, but let's get into check CPU and see if it agrees. 
Yes, indeed. This is literally a relabeled AM5x86 with a 4x multiplier. And at 133 MHz, this thing works perfectly, noticeably faster and solid as a rock. I'm not sure if AMD binned these relabeled chips, but even if they did, considering how well the AM5x86 overclocks as a general rule, pretty sure there's going to be some headroom available. In my experience, I'd say about 80 to 90% of AM5x86s can handle a 160 MHz clock speed at a 40 MHz front side bus. There is a very steep wall beyond that point though, and only a very small number of chips can exceed it. To my surprise, the system wouldn't boot at all with a 40 MHz front side bus. Most AM5x86s will do this at the default 3.45 volts, but I was able to get the system to post at 3.6 volts, and it was enough to complete some benchmarks. So I think a 150 MHz or 3x50 clock may be a little bit of a better choice for this one if the other components in the system can handle it. The next chip here is an interesting one. The original 486DX266 from Intel was released all the way back in 1992, if I'm not mistaken. It's probably the most widely used 486 for quite some time. The date code on this chip, though, is from early 1998, a time when, you know, 400 megahertz CPUs were being released, and it's certainly not something that the average consumer would have been interested at that point in time. Now that said, 486s did continue to be used in many industrial systems and they were a cheap low power solution for applications that didn't really need a lot of processing power. The model number of this one ends in 16BGC, which is a suffix that I've only really ever seen with the later produced AM5x86s. So unlike the last one we looked at, this chip can't be a relabeled AM5x86 because it requires the 2x multiplier to get the rated 66 megahertz clock speed. By 1998, I really doubt that AMD would produce be producing true DX2s with a single multiplier while they had fabs creating DX4s and AM5x86s. And what do you think the odds are if I set the jumper for a DX4's 3x multiplier that this chip will show its true colors? Let's find out. And there you have it. <laughs> this DX2 is actually a DX4. And with a 16 BGC prefix, we know that this core probably shares a lot in common with the AM5x86s that were being produced at the time, just without the 4x multiplier being available. Now you might think that not having a 4x multiplier is a disadvantage, but having a chip with a core like this and a two times multiplier can make for some very interesting high front side bus overclocking. Even though this chip is rated for 66 megahertz, I suspect that its overclocking headroom would still be pretty close to what we'd see with an AM5x86. And sure enough, I had no problem at all running the CPU at three times 50 megahertz for a 150 megahertz clock. That's a 127% overclock. And really there aren't that many x86 CPUs in history that can achieve overclocks beyond 100%. So that's really cool. But what about pushing it further on a 2x multiplier? Although this motherboard only officially supports up to a 50 MHz front side bus, the MX clock generator chip that's used supports some additional frequency selections, including 60, 66, and 80 MHz. And it's very clearly stated in the data sheet that this can be done with the three different uh, jumpers. Absolutely ludicrous bus speeds for a 486. And let me tell you, not a simple feat getting it working either. Almost everything in the system needs to be loosened up, including cache timings, memory timings, PCI and ISA dividers. I'm really not gonna to get too much into it today because I wanna do a future video on some high FSB 486 overclocking, so stay tuned for that. But I will share this with you. Here is the AMD DX266 running at 160 megahertz with an 80 megahertz front side bus. I almost didn't believe it at first, but the scope doesn't lie. And even though the cache and memory timings are pretty nasty and they do negate a lot of the potential performance gain with the bus frequency, it is totally stable though. I mean, this is a 142% overclock of the CPU, definitely the highest CPU overclock I've ever achieved on any platform, period. So there you have it. Obviously made financial sense for AMD to produce chips like this and enthusiasts willing to do some tweaking could reap the benefits. This is really something we've seen numerous times over the course of history, including taking advantage of unlocked CPU multipliers, disabled GPU pipelines, and even enabling hidden CPU cores like was possible on the AMD Phenome X2 and X3 processors from back in 2008. 
Although overclocking is still a thing these days, it really feels like manufacturers lock things down more and more than they used to. Taking advantage of shared silicon across different products isn't really something you see too much anymore, unfortunately. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you enjoy my channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find more information in the description below. Thanks again.